You're listening to Secrets of a Bridal Seamstress podcast. I'm your host, Nadine Bozeman. In this podcast, I'm sharing business systems and strategies specifically tailored to the bridal sewing industry so you can build your own modern and profitable bridal alterations business. Join me as I also get to chat with fellow seamstresses and share their personal success stories. I'm so glad you're here and that we can grow together in this unique trade. Welcome back to another episode of Secrets of a Bridal Seamstress. I am so excited, and I know you're going to be excited too, to be hearing from Grace from Grace Lane, London. And this is kind of the kickoff of a fun season within the podcast where we're going to be showcasing stories from fellow seamstresses. So this is a great way to kick off the season because Grace, you have so many layers to your business and your portfolio. And it's like, you think you've reached one cool thing and then the next thing pops up and then you see the next thing that you do. And it's like, you are, you're really impressive. So I'm a little Twitter pated, but I'm really excited that you're here. And <laughs> thank you so, so much. That's so lovely to hear. I'm so <laughs> delighted to be here. And it's just, yeah, it's really lovely to connect with another seamstress who's, you know, all the way over in America. And before we jumped on record, it was so interesting. I think just we've got so many similar experiences, despite mm -hmm. being, you know, miles and miles and miles, countries apart. Yeah. <laughs> Grace was saying, I've been listening and it's like, we have the same, we go through the same thing. We like are working for the same thing in our business. We probably have the same client struggles. You know what I mean? It's like the same craft. It's so beautiful. So I love hearing actually that quite surreal talking to you now having listened to episodes I'm a bit like oh my goodness <laughs> it's really yeah, I'm yeah. so honored and thank you for like making the time it was fun like okay wait what time is it there and what time is it here so it was fun working with the time zone so this is very exciting for me too so how about you start with just sharing how did you even get into sewing like let's not even dive into the business side yet but how did you love this craft so I began as so many people I think do as being a very creative child and always mm -hmm. loving making, loving working with my hands, painting, all of that kind of thing. And I actually didn't really know it was going to turn into sewing mm. for a really, really long time. I could have gone down a few different paths and, you know, you don't really know that sewing is a viable career option when you're younger. Mm -hmm. So I, it definitely took me a while to work out that this is definitely what I want to do and, and find yeah. this out as a, you know, this is a really viable and great career to go into. So mm -hmm. I did a BA in fashion design and that was at a university called Southampton Solent University. And that was a three year course. So that was quite technical and was very sort of pattern cutting and learning to use the yeah. industrial sewing machine. So I guess that was kind so of- So before that, like, were you, the, yeah. were you the high school kid who like liked to make your own outfits? Were you ever into that? Or did it take like design school to get you into making things like that? That's such a good question because I think I was, yeah. Looking, just thinking about it now, <laughs> I definitely was. I loved always, <laughs> yeah, like customizing and- creating outfits and I actually mm -hmm. had a best friend called Gemma and actually she was probably the more like the fun creative one who definitely was we were a bit of a pair like always making outfits together so mm -hmm. yeah it was definitely like bubbling and it was definitely mm -hmm. very much there yeah without me necessarily knowing oh I'm definitely gonna go into fashion I'm definitely gonna go into sewing I always mm -hmm. loved that side of like of the industry yeah yeah and then was your first job out of school like sewing and creating or did you have to kind of get a job job to like pay the bills or how did you move <laughs> so, into grace lane yeah I definitely I never had any kind of like I didn't have any contacts in this world Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any family. That's so weird to think either. about now because I look at you and I'm like, you're probably the queen of contacts right now. And it's like, there was a point in your life when you didn't have them. <laughs> yeah, no, completely. <laughs> I didn't have 
not a single person I knew in this world wow. at all mm -hmm. and also my you know I think a lot of people who are seamstresses maybe a, a mum or a grandparent mm -hmm. so I didn't not my family think I'm absolutely bonkers for enjoying sewing because <laughs> they hate it <laughs> they just can't get their head around the idea that someone that you know I've gone into this you know I'm not from a family that's ever done it yeah. so I it was I and I always had jobs so I always like through uni and through like college I was working in like coffee shops and like always self-funded like never mm -hmm. had any family money either to kind of you know there was nothing there was no kind of cushion there was no rent paid Every, yeah. I've always kind of had to do that alongside of it mm -hmm. And I think we'll probably talk about, you know, later, like hurdles, but I think that's probably the biggest hurdle that lots of creatives face is mm -hmm. that you are trying to break into something, but you're also having to pay the bills. Right, right, right. Um, and like so be room to still be creative. And it's like, but that, but how do you be creative while you're stressed <laughs> trying to yeah. make things work? So yeah, I'm excited to kind of tap into that. So for listeners who are unfamiliar with your brand, like I said, I gave a little teaser earlier, like there's so many different facets. And so maybe we can start with the bridal side and even just the bridal side alone, you do like kind of, I don't want to use the term basic, but yeah, your standard alterations, mm -hmm. but you also do a uh, bespoke design and you restore vintage dresses. So those are like basically three separate businesses in one right? <laughs> yeah. And <that> <laughs> because there are like such too. different skills. Yeah. So what of those three has become your favorite? And we could talk about all three because we would love to talk about all three, but I'd also want to hear what your favorite is. Uh, it, like hands down now, my favorite is vintage restorations. Mm. And part of that is because of the sustainability aspect Mm -hmm. And part of it is because of actually how creative you can get with re with all the reworking and all the things that you could do. Yeah. And I also love the kind of client it attracts. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. get really kind of fun, creative brides who are really I'm so every time someone goes for a vintage and is wanting to work with me to kind of redesign it. I just, I'm so proud and I'm so excited and buzzing to work with them because they're just, they see it can be something amazing, mm -hmm. but it's not there yet, but they right, know right. it will be. Yeah. And that takes a very special kind of bride. It's not for everybody. Absolutely. Of, and I don't know if it would be for me. I think, right. you know, I might Too much of a control freak. That's me Yeah, for <laughs> definitely. Like lots of people want to walk out of the fitting room and have that wow moment straight yeah. away mm -hmm. whereas with the reworking you're not going to get that wow moment straight away it's going to be a little bit of a journey mm -hmm. um you're going to have it down the line but you have to really trust the process yeah. so that yeah. has now become my favorite yeah. area but I don't think I could have done the vintage reworking had I not had a background in bespoke because mm -hmm. I'm taking all of those bespoke skills and applying it because often you're you're taking the whole dress apart mm -hmm. so it can be such a dramatic transformation that yeah. you really need to know what's possible mm -hmm. and I think I've definitely learned what is possible as well and making suggestions that will really improve that dress is probably like where the skill comes in Right. Right. Yeah. I was just having a conversation with somebody about like the difference between like bespoke work and alterations and how it really uses just different parts of your brain. Because with mm -hmm. alterations, you're in the problem solving mindset of like, it's like mm -hmm. a puzzle, like we're taking the dress apart and then we have to put it back together, you know, looking the exact same, but just fitting better. And then with bespoke designs, it's like you you have to just use like a completely creative side of your brain where you're thinking of something that isn't there yet. And you're coming up with something brand new. There's problem solving side. And then there's like the creative design side, you know? Definitely. And I think bespoke can be very daunting for that reason, because it, the possibilities are limitless mm -hmm. and that bride is trusting 
obviously they have a lot of ideas that they're bringing to the table but they're trusting you to make it into a dress that's going to look good right, and not a right. Frankenstein's monster dress where it's <laughs> a crazy bit of this and a crazy bit of that and exactly so something I love about the vintage reworking is you already have something that they love mm -hmm. and you are it's kind of the ultimate alterations project because you have to fix the fit and then bring it in line with modern sensibilities in terms of design mm -hmm. so you but it's le much less pressure than bespoke because they've already kind of fallen in love with the dress rather yeah. than with bespoke each fitting they're seeing it come together but they haven't yeah. ever seen it as a dress in the first place, really. It's always uh, something that they're imagining. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for me, the restorations is what I hope to sort of probably at some point make like the majority of my business. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I could be, I would be very happy doing them all day, every day. Yeah. You recently posted about a dress that you're currently working on and it's really teeny tiny. I mean, it is very, Ooh. very tiny. How often do you run into that? Because I, I don't know. I always feel like when I'm trying things on, like things just feel small. So I'm like, were people like smaller back then or were clothes just made smaller? And how do you, do you find that like as an issue that comes up with vintage restoration? Definitely. And a lot <laughs> of vintage dresses were originally made to be bespoke mm -hmm. so they were handmade say in like the 1950s for somebody and yeah. that person might have had really you know tiny slender arms and a really tiny waist but a bigger bust so you're also mm -hmm. kind of contending with it was someone's exact figure that that dress was wow. made for and then we're making it to fit another exact figure mm -hmm. and they were often worn with quite intense undergarments like corsets and we don't really I don't really fit them often with a corset to begin with that people are just trying them on with normal shapewear so yeah. you know waists were drawn in like unnaturally as well so but in most cases the dresses can be sized up so I don't feel too worried about like there's now I feel like I've learned the tips and tricks that you can do and if a dress can't be sized up, then I'll, I can kind of say outright, you know, this is not really going to be possible. And I'll do really kind of clear expectation management yeah. from like the get go. Right, 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 right. Which is probably a tricky conversation, but it's better to be had earlier in the game than mm -hmm. farther down the road. And it's like, okay, but this is still not doable. So with each, because I'm, I'm thinking of listeners who do offer similar different offerings right like they also do some vintage restoration they want to do some bespoke design and then like the alterations are kind of like the bread and butter like your standard alterations but you have really successfully marketed to these individual audiences under one umbrella you know what I mean like it's still very mm -hmm. clearly all three of those are under Grace Lane how do you market that whether it's like on social media or through bridal shops or how are you reaching each specific audience so well so I think it's happened because at the core of what I do is for each service, it's fundamentally me being a seamstress and mm -hmm. me making and fitting. So they're, for each service, they're getting the same package, really. And they are just sort of yeah, interested in whichever avenue that they want to sort of work the way they want to work with me. But ultimately, I've marketed myself as a seamstress and having these making skills and fitting skills first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And that's my core skill. That's what I love doing. And that's what I'm always offering. So if I post a bespoke, I think it can often strengthen my alterations offering because they see, oh, wow, she's made that. She'd definitely be able to alter my wedding dress. Right, and the right. same with the reworking. Oh, she's reworked this 1940s gown. She'll definitely be able to hem this. Mm -hmm. And I think having those three different avenues has also allowed me to cherry pick 
which projects I want to work with. Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. I get a lot of inquiries for each and I now am in a position where I, you know, I work with the, the projects that really speak to me and that I know I'll do a really amazing job on. And I kind of pick the kind of the, more, the bigger, like more meaty projects that need a lot of work. Mm-hmm. So I think people come to me for the complex alterations, the bigger jobs, rather than I'm probably not your person for like just a little like strap alteration or like right. something simple. And I'll get some of those inquiries too, but I'll quite, I'm very happy to kind of pass them on to some like my seamstress like, like friends who are in the area who right. are wanting to pick up like the lot, the like the mold, like the quick jobs. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's an interesting one. And I'm glad that actually that you said that it's kind of clear that there are the three avenues of what I do under the bridal umbrella Mm -hmm. and I think it's something that as a creative I really enjoy having lots of different projects and lots of things on the go and it's happened quite organically because I really I love doing a lot of things and working in lots of different ways it never really happened as a planned sort of marketing strategy yeah yeah just the way it's evolved right and your mind just keeps going so it's like it keeps the variety coming in (laughs) yeah it's so so, it's exactly how it's happened Mm -hmm. and I sometimes think maybe at some point I'll wind one of them down and just niche because I also Mm -hmm. think there's a strength in having your one lane that you're the specialist in you become mm-hmm. the go-to in in your area for that sort of you know the alterations the bespoke the reworking so I definitely also never rule out going down like one of those roads maybe that will mm-hmm. be the reworking in the future yeah but I really love right now I do really love the variety yeah yeah keeps you on your toes keeps me on my toes keeps me busy keeps me booked <laughs> maybe a bit too booked and keeps you entertained and you mentioned earlier that you recently married so how was like did you design your own dress or how did that work yes so I got married last year in April so it's coming up to the year still totally a newlywed not even a whole year (laughs) still a newlywed and actually getting married and being that side of the of the fence was really mind eye-opening Um, Oh, yeah. And I think I've now become even like sort of have an even better awareness of Mm -hmm. what I do. And even things when I was reaching out to other suppliers like caterers or the photographer, I Mm -hmm. loved seeing actually what their correspondence was like. And I think it's, Mm -hmm. you know, really helped me, you know, get a bigger picture of the whole industry. Mm. Oh, I'd like to hear your take on this because I know some people are, you know, really refining like their automated messages Mm -hmm. and automated responses to have it be quicker. And then others, I'm kind of in between because I like that, but I still have my, my initial message to brides is the personal response. And then I kind of have these like candy mails that go out, you know, but how did you, did you experience that? Like both sides from other vendors? I did. And I think as long as you're getting back to a bride within a few days, Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters whether it's automated or whether it's a personal response necessarily. I think getting a quick answer is really key or like a quick, here's my welcome guide, just to get Mm -hmm. a really initial snapshot of what they might offer and prices. Mm-hmm. and I think yeah I'm definitely I'm not automated either yet I have some automated areas but I'm not mm-hmm. fully I still do like the emailing all myself and reply individually mm-hmm. but yeah I definitely a lot of people are going down the automated route and I can really see why yeah when you think it's probably the future let's like I definitely wouldn't be opposed to moving towards it Mm -hmm. but I think as long as you're capturing that person quickly 
and also getting the information out that they need for that initial like sale like just to like keep them chatting and kind of get the key sort of things that you know are really important over yeah. to them yeah yeah and that's kind of where I was feeling like oh I gotta kind of up my game because when I was busy like I try to send a response within like 48 hours. But then when I was busy, it was just like, okay, kind of piling on. And then it'd be like, okay, maybe once a week. But I know when these brides, like they are waiting for the their vendor to get back to them so they can make the booking and move on. Like it's a lot more important to them than it is to me. Cause I'm like, well, I'm, my calendar is pretty full anyway. So I don't really need the business, but you know what I mean? And I don't want that to become my, my mindset behind my communication. <laughs> no, I think that's so true and when you're in the thick of bridal season at, when you're a, a one-man band you actually mm -hmm. don't need to keep booking brides at that stage right so it can become yeah unfortunately we do have a limit to our time there might come a point in the year where once you're booked what almost is the benefit to us to go through an inbox with saying I'm sorry I'm fully booked I'm sorry I'm fully booked Mm -hmm. And just using hours of your evening, replying to clients, basically, no, I can't work with you. So yeah. I guess that's where I maybe the automated thing. I think mm -hmm. I probably do need to look at implementing this year because there yeah. definitely comes a point in the year where, yeah, I don't get back to everybody. I know. <laughs> I like to give someone at least a no so they right, can move right. on and find someone else. Mm -hmm. But it's... It's really, it's about, I think also about with the whole, it kind of ties in with the scaling up issue because I've definitely built my business on being it just me and mm -hmm. me doing all of the fitting and then I do all of the sewing. Yeah. Um, so I, I, once I'm booked, you know, that's my time gone. I can't right. overbook. So maybe when you have the automated system you know is the temptation that you know it's you're almost getting too many clients I don't know yeah, yeah. this might be it's uh I, I definitely do want to look into it though yeah I know and it's I think especially it's just been kind of like a buzzword I think lately of like you know there's just there's also like a specific company that people are kind of working a lot with mm. that I hear and come up and so it's like okay and I see pros and cons. And I think like you said, when you're so used to being kind of the one woman show and we we already mentioned the control thing. So I feel like both of us are in the same boat with that. Like releasing the control is another, <laughs> another part that yeah. I'm like, I don't know. So yeah, something to consider, but that's interesting hearing your perspective as a bride of like, you want to hear back from, from your vendors and it probably really improved the way you communicate with your brides now, because you have that like empathy piece as a recent Definitely. bride. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I changed my mind a lot, by the way, about my <laughs> wedding dress. So now when a bride is, you know, having a, her indecisive moment and thinking mm -hmm. like, oh, have we made the right decision? I'm not sure if I should have gone with a different fabric. I understand that now in a way that I think before I, I didn't really fully take on board yeah. how high stakes that decisions and those decisions feel. Mm -hmm. And having been a bride and understanding, you know, this is such an important day and you just want to get it right. It yeah. definitely opened my eyes to being way, way more kind of compassionate and considerate with like guiding and, and giving lots of people options. And, and sometimes people just need to talk it through and you're the, the person who they have to talk it through with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can, you know, it's you have to be quite empathetic I think and bespoke I would also say I don't know whether your seamstresses have found this as well but I think it attracts a type of client who is quite a perfectionist and and they want things a certain way oh yeah so that's also going to be probably uh, an added element of mm -hmm. of working with the the bespoke clients you become so their sounding board and making sure that yeah you're you're really in that six to eight months you're really there for them mm -hmm. oh, by the end of funny. my wedding dress once my wedding dress was made and done I had had a whatsapp group with my mum and my sister 
and they I think they couldn't wait for the dress to be done because <laughs> they, think they could bear having one more message oh of what gosh. do you think of this what do you think yeah. of that yeah oh that is so funny I and I remember gosh one of my first years in business I had a bride and I, I still can't believe I took this project on I think it was like that season where it's like you just wanted to take everything and be like okay what can I do you know what I mean mm-hmm. which thinking back wow that was such a risk for the bride but she She was very happy in the end, so it was all fine, but she bought a dress. It was an A-line and she wanted to be turned into a mermaid dress. And then she wanted to be lace long sleeves and lace. She basically wanted like a slip, like a fitted slip with fitted lace over it. And I was like, okay. And I took on the project and she had so many fittings with me and Mm -hmm. she was so particular what was placed where. And I had so much patience because I was so excited for this first big project, you know, and I think I did it for like $800 or it was like a very low amount for all the work that we did. And I still can't believe that like we finished it. And, but that was my first experience with, okay, this is the kind of person that this work attracts is like, Mm -hmm. wait, can it actually be like, and it's just like a little tweak, you know, like a a half inch tweak. And I'm like, oh, like every piece, every applique has to be perfectly placed. And they have this because they're, they're in their dress so often too. Like they see so many steps as opposed to two to three fittings with a typical alterations job. And then with, you know, custom work, it's like, they're seeing each step and it's like, "Mm," they just, see so much more because they're in the dress definitely so more. and not knowing when to stop maybe and that <laughs> because they're having the bespoke yeah. experience they I not think knowing it, when to stop. <laughs> not knowing when to stop that's and, so true yeah <laughs> and also like with the you I think you have with bespoke you build up that they can have these changes mm-hmm. so it's kind of you I think it's a really monster. hard balance to you're inviting them to be creative and design with you but mm-hmm. you also have to get the job done and right. like we are trying to run a business here and it can escalate into like I think every bespoke I've ever done has mm-hmm. always been like two to three extra fittings than what I would have originally forecast right, right. and I think right. that's very normal for bespoke and I think you like down the line you you know I build that into the price at the beginning now but it's just the way that those clients like to work and it's kind of the Mm -hmm. nature of bespoke it's why I then love offsetting it with having the alterations clients because I get them in and like you said two or three fittings they're out the door happy done Mm -hmm. love the dress love the fit and they're off (laughs) <laughs> yeah exactly it's like as long as ahead of time you have the expectations that this is going to take longer they're going to be more particular and then you can kind of have that mindset so you can be patient you know you're mm-hmm. not expecting them to respond the same way as like your average alterations client you know which is like oh looks great okay let's here are my new shoes you know like that's the biggest decision they have to make is what shoes am I going to wear you know so yeah. as long as we're coming to the appointments like with that patience piece that is kind of a game changer too so we're all setting each other up for success <laughs> definitely definitely and I think something that I really love about your podcast is actually that you you know brides over the years I think not so much now but I think there was this like I hate the word bridezilla and actually, you know, we have a huge amount of respect for our clients and we don't want anyone to ever feel like they're being difficult with us because mm-hmm. we are here to, we love what we do and we mm-hmm. we really want them to come away really happy. And I think when I meet someone and they say, oh, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a bridal seamstress. They're like, oh, that must be hard. Yeah. And I really don't like that because... It's like the big, it's such a joy and such an it honor. Is. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think don't really get like, difficult. Yeah, like the difficult clients are like literally what? Like one in 150. You know what I'm saying? Like the ratio yeah. is like not even, I mean, I'm sure when we first start out, we don't know how to filter them out. So we probably mm-hmm. attract more difficult clients from 
early on in the business, but then it's like, once we know what we're doing, we know how to market to who we want to work with and all those things and how to communicate better and set up expectations. You know, I think if we just like empathy goes a long way in understanding that when brides show up, like they're nervous, they don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. We can't expect them to read our minds or to like understand the process. And so showing up with that empathy, I think eliminates a lot of unnecessary drama in itself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, it just automatically like lowers the temperature in the room when you don't need to. Definitely. And it's probably the most expensive dress they've ever bought. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you are, they are also probably second guessing themselves having the wobble. Was it even the right dress? Right. So there's all these factors going on that aren't really to do with you, but you really need to be there for them to kind of just guide them and make sure that they're kind of nurtured and feel yeah. happy and and that like they will get the result and the the outfit that they have that they really want right right and if you know if you know yourself and you know that the patient's piece is not there specializing in bespoke might not be for you <laughs> like, that's a really good point if you know you're like oh, okay this is annoying to me then just don't set yourself up like not everybody has to do all the things like not everybody needs to do custom work like if you love like you mentioned earlier like the in and out jobs okay if the vintage is more your jam and like I love how you're giving yourself the freedom to just focus on that like mm -hmm. maybe I don't need other things and it's okay not to do everything that you see everybody else doing out there because you know social media has become such a loud a loud voice now too so we're seeing what other businesses are doing or the highlights of what they're doing and then it gets in our heads like maybe we should be doing that too so if you're hearing some of these things and you're like that's what it takes to work with custom work I'm out like it's okay if it's not your jam <laughs> that's a really good point because I think the like comparison now is mm -hmm. so can be really difficult to yeah. kind yeah. of silence and you just have to run with the area that suits you best and kind of mm -hmm. shut out the noise right and think actually this works for me and mm -hmm. I don't have to do everything and there's a right. reason why I like doing this mm -hmm. and yeah. I there's a huge I have like I think I could down the line as well imagine a life of just also doing like pure bridal alterations as well mm -hmm. and having the and picking up lots of small jobs mm -hmm. and having mm -hmm. the the jobs that take like two to three fittings yep, and I think yeah. I could be really happy doing that and I think my mm -hmm. husband would probably quite like yeah. that because he'd probably see <laughs> me a bit more but yeah and that's what my business has become I think especially like since the podcast and growing the membership like that's what I have capacity for and that's what I enjoy doing that's what I enjoy showing up for and now I'm doing more like custom veils and those little pieces and that's what lights me up but I think for a while I was kind of forcing like, oh, I should promote, you know, customizations or I should promote, but it's like, but if I'm not enjoying it, who am I promoting it for? Like, just to make yeah. sure that like, I still keep up with these skills. Okay. I'm still going to have the skills whenever I want to pull them out. But if I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. And then it's like, there comes a point where it's like, literally there's not enough money that would make it fun for me. So let's just call it what it is and be okay. You know what I mean? So. I totally know what you mean and I, I like we know how much you have to give to do to be a bridal seamstress yeah. and actually I think and it also takes a huge amount for you to do what you do for the podcast and the retreats which yeah, by the yeah. way I'm so I just wish I was in the US so I could do a retreat <laughs> but I think that they so I think yeah you have to know what you want to give your energies to Mm hmm. Yeah. It's definitely you don't need to do everything. Right. Right. Do you know what I think? Actually, my personality type, I think I do struggle to settle on an area. And that's the kind of mind I have where I want to do everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm always thinking about the next thing a bit. And I don't know whether that is always good. Sometimes right. I think it can, it could be good to just be kind of like happy where I am mm -hmm. and continue down this road. Yeah. But like for instance, next week I'm all, I'm planning a bridal shoot for oh, a new um, collection 
and it's just so typical me that I don't really have time for this so <laughs> it's just being shoehorned in to like my already <laughs> crazy schedule but mm -hmm. maybe that's the way it just has to work I don't yeah. know for the you have seasons where you can take on more or like to have a more quiet schedule and you have the flexibility, mm -hmm. but I think it's maybe giving yourself permission to like not be as busy. It's okay if I let this be like a chill season or whatever, like who are we trying to keep up with? And most of the time it's like ourselves, <laughs> you know? Definitely. No, you're so right. And actually I think this time of year, February is really good for development. Mm -hmm. And like that was why I was really happy to like jump on the call with you now because mm -hmm. it is quite a good like reflection time for me mm -hmm. this time of year. Like it is my quieter time. Yeah. 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 We, cause I, I wonder if we have like similar climates too, because like in the Pacific yes. Northwest in Washington state, like we definitely have a slow season, but I love it. Like, yes, I have to plan ahead financially to enjoy a really slow season, but it's like this time of like reflection and rest and I'm home a lot and I love being home. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I'm like a professional homebody and it's, I could never do this nonstop if I didn't have specific seasons, you know? Definitely. So. Yeah, there's definitely, I think we probably do. Our, my season is kind of getting, I'd say busy from like April through right. till now kind of end of September. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the colder, the, like the cooler months of the year are much quieter. Right, um, right. Although Especially since, now that like outdoor weddings are so popular, like mm -hmm. there's, we have some pretty indoor venues, but like nobody wants to get married inside. So like the wedding, the winter weddings definitely settle down. But I know that, okay, so kind of switching gears here. I know that you have a completely different facet to your business, which is like also like, wait, what? So you're also a celebrity mm -hmm. seamstress. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Cause I want to talk about like, how did that happen? Especially, you know, at the beginning of the call, you were saying how you didn't have any contacts coming out of school mm -hmm. and like starting from square one. And then, you know, one of your most recent posts, like you were sewing for Madonna <laughs> and James Corden. And it's like, okay, so how did that happen? And how do you keep up with all of that? Like, how do you have Grace Lane that we just expounded upon? It's like huge. And then you're like, oh yeah, BT dubs. I sew for Madonna. Like what? So, yeah, that's a lot. It's hard to know where to start, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, the other side of my business is exactly the same service. It's still exactly what I do for brides, but mm -hmm. it's just for, like, film and fashion. And that came around because after I graduated, I worked in... My, my first job was for Alexander McQueen, and I was there in the bespoke atelier, which was an amazing place to learn. Mm -hmm, um, and sure. then I went on to a, a tailor's, a menswear tailor's. Do you guys know Savile Row? Yeah. Which, so it's like the kind of the, I guess it's like the epicenter of kind of sartorial tailoring in London. Mm -hmm. So I had a, I was there for two and a half years and I got lots of tailoring skills and kind of really learnt that side of things but I was really missing gowns and women's wear and that's really where like my heart mm -hmm. is but I think such a benefit of that is I know so many bridal seamstresses that like I would never want to touch a men's suit because I'm like totally different ball game you know and the fact that you are so skilled in both is like amazing I really loved my time in Savile Row and yeah. it was an incredible and actually a lot of the tailors it's kind of a job for life and mm. if you connect with it and if you love it lots of the the tailors there you know had been was their only job they'd ever had and had mm -hmm. and they were clearly going to carry on until retirement like you if you love that kind of work I think yeah you really you never need another job but right. I loved the skills and I loved the product and the fabrics and it was so interesting seeing how like a high-end tailor tailoring business that you know makes for the royals and it makes for the Saudi Arabia royal family and Qatar royal family and all these incredible crazy clients and you're just you're I was soaking up a lot there yeah. um but ultimately it wasn't quite my right I really really missed gowns and 
and and variety most of the time mm. you're working on navy blue <laughs> like suits and as <laughs> the most creative it gets is like when they change a lining yeah <laughs> so it was <laughs> very kind of similar every yeah. day so I then went to work for a it was a couture atelier in an area called Knightsbridge just behind a department store called Harrods and they made one-off bespoke gowns for a very similar kind of client as the Savile Row client Mm -hmm. but unfortunately they folded they went under it was around the time of the kind of the 2010 like financial crash so Mm -hmm. the luxury market in London was really suffering so the I was made redundant and like the whole team had to go Mm -hmm. so then it was like right think again what am I going to do now Mm -hmm. and I I actually then went to work for a supplier which made men's suits for a a brand a UK brand called Marks and Spencers and Mm -hmm. I hated it so much it was working on Excel making like garment tech packs on the computer all day every day like communicating with the factories Mm -hmm. in Asia, shipping like, you know, 20,000 units. It just, it was all wrong. It didn't feel me. Yeah. I think I was there for about four months and then, and all the while I was job hunting because I I couldn't stay in that role. I knew it wasn't for me. And then I got a job in a company called Angels. And that was really where um, my, I think I got my best skills and also like, some really, really amazing clients and contacts. Mm. They make costumes for film and TV and they have a really incredible setup with, they have three different really big workrooms, which just are making the most amazing costumes for, they, we worked for some things for Broadway, for the West End and for like the Hollywood films that Mm -hmm. were filming at the time in London. Mm -hmm. So I worked there and I had a re- I was working under a really talented pattern cutter and she like really trained the team up and really taught these fundamental skills that I use today. Wow. So that was the kind of the point in my journey where I was I felt like I found my kind of my my role and I found what I love to do and my product type and my people. Mm-hmm. And from there, I then went freelance um, and that was in 2016. So I set up Grace Lane London and I was making wedding dresses, mainly for friends and family at that point to kind of get my confidence up and get my skills up. And then I was also doing like freelance work for film and TV. And I think like the way that I've built up my celebrity client base is really, I think, maybe a unique thing to London where there is so much happening, there's so much being filmed here. Mm. When you do one job, you get recommended to the next job. Mm -hmm. And there's actually not a huge base of people for what we do. Right, right. And that's probably getting smaller and smaller too. (laughs) Getting smaller and smaller. And I think, you know every job I've ever done with like celebrities has always then that stylist has often then recommended me to another stylist he's Mm -hmm. recommended me to another stylist and that's kind of the way it has snowballed to then building up to like working with the likes of doing fittings for the likes of Madonna because Mm -hmm. I have it's just all through word of mouth and all through recommendations and I have the separate Instagram page for the film and tv work so I'll often notice I'll get like a follow or an ad from a stylist and then maybe a couple of weeks later they'll book me for a fitting and I think although people wouldn't find me that way they found me through a word of mouth recommendation they just like to go on to the Instagram just to see what I have been up to and in the celebrity world just to kind of verify okay she looks like she knows what she's doing right right and yeah it's probably a a bit of an annoying thing to say because this isn't necessarily translatable 
to all over oh yeah the world it's or... definitely where you live like it's definitely absolutely where I live. yeah but still like that I mean the fact that you and I you know I kind of picked up hearing the details of the story of it did come from like okay you applied to work here and then you moved on here and it's like every but like it's just so cool to hear like everybody starts somewhere you know I think sometimes we have this idea that people just like born into this job that we think would be really cool and it actually really does come from applying for the first job and then Mm. on to the second location and then doing the next thing and each step when you first I, I forget what your first stop was after school was that Seville Road there was Alexander McQueen. Okay, that's so, right. Like when you applied there, like you couldn't foresee what you're going to be doing now, but you just took the first step, which kind of probably seemed like an obvious step, you know? Definitely. And I think when I first got my first, that first role, I knew nothing. I was so <laughs> kind of, yeah, I was like, how will I, I was, you know, working in the atelier, seeing mm-hmm. these very talented makers thinking, how am I ever gonna, how would I ever ne- like learn how to do that? Right. And all the while you are, even if you don't feel like you are, you are absorbing it and mm-hmm. taking it all in. And you might not like, also I, I definitely found with my journey through fashion into kind of the film and TV and then, and then into bridal, I didn't connect with and like every role. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely recommend to somebody to like try different avenues see what you get on best with and don't don't be worried if if it's you know you've tried something and it's not for you because the road is long Mm -hmm. it's fine if you don't like a position just keep applying and and I think definitely my 20s I'm 35 now my 20s were quite an exploration time where I did a ton of jobs and Mm -hmm. really kind of explored creatively what I wanted to do and it doesn't and actually another thing that I would you never know always keep in touch with like workmates as well because you never know when something's going to come up it Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be you know a lot but just the people that I worked with for most of those roles I'm still in touch with so just old fashioned networking. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't burn bridges. <laughs> Don't burn bridges if possible. You know? Yeah. Because <laughs> you never know what's going to happen five or 10 years down the road. Yeah. No. You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier when you were talking about like funding your own education and paying mm-hmm. for rent as you were, you know, building up your portfolio and all this stuff. And because I, I, there's so many really good things about this conversation and I'm really excited for listeners, especially those who are like just getting started or they're just dreaming of, okay, this is where I would want my business to be. But right now it's like, I'm just getting a couple clients a year or whatever, mm-hmm. or just trying to balance it out with work. So like, what were struggles that you, it, it may be the financial piece or what were some other struggles that like was part of the grind of being a seamstress trying to get to the next step you know yeah that's a really good question because I I think probably a just a general fear like I think putting your work out there is scary making that Instagram page and getting your work out there and saying I'm doing this that's mm-hmm. probably like an initial roadblock that can feel really scary. Yeah. But you will be so surprised at how supportive and how pleased probably people around you will be and to just go for it. Mm-hmm. And I also think to start with making and altering for your friends and family in the beginning, like they were my first clients. Oh, me too. Yeah. Coworkers. So- yeah it was like bags of stuff for me to alter and I was like okay but I learned so much you know definitely and being able to say to that they won't mind you using them their like but wedding photos or whatever it is that you're doing for them you can photograph it so I think like yeah not being you don't have to have a CEO mindset from day one it doesn't have to happen overnight like Mm -hmm. or quickly like always always at the center of everything 
work on your craft and get really good at sewing and the rest will fall into place. If you can sew, you will be able to make an income, a really good income for the rest of your life. You'll never mm -hmm. be out of work. So build up those skills first and foremost and everything will just sort of happen around you. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. often say to people who are just starting out, actually like being a seamstress is such a viable career. Oh, totally. I think there might be from generations gone by, I think there's like sewing hasn't necessarily been given the, been put on that pedestal that maybe other artisans and crafts have been. And may, I think we're entering an era now where people are like love what we do. And I think like trust that there is work out there and mm -hmm you can make a really good living from it. Right, right. I think the that our the perceived value is changing with what we do. And mm. I think it's only going to help us in the long run, you know? And that was just really encouraging because we can so easily think, you know, we already touched on the social media piece. We can think that it, things happen overnight or that like things come easier to other people, but it's like all of the work that happens in the background it is a long-term game. You know what I mean? It's like mm. finding what you want to do or what your niche is going to be, or like just even getting better at what you do. Like it just takes time and you can't rush that. Like a seasoned seamstress were called that for a reason, or I don't even know if I would call myself seasoned. Cause I feel like I haven't been doing it long enough. You know what I mean? Like I see these other, you like, definitely you know, are. <laughs> but it's like, it, because it's seasoned because it takes time and it's not just the actual skills, but it's like, okay, I've learned lessons of how to interact with people or how to network better or how to, you know, promote my brand without getting sweaty or whatever. You know what I mean? Like all of these things that you learn along the way. So what is something that somebody could do like this week? Like they're so excited because they learned all the things that Grace Lane was able to do. So they're inspired, but what can they do like this week to push their dream a little bit further? I think really go back to the fundamentals of sewing and get your basics right. So mm. get a couple of really key skills down. So there's a few things that I think we get asked to do time and time again. And so just, you know, is that doing a really lovely pin hem or is that what else would be like putting in a zip, a, mm. an invisible mm -hmm. zip, or is that, like learning like a really secure way of hand sewing on some buttons mm -hmm. getting a couple of really key skills learnt in the evening mm -hmm. only maybe probably takes you know an evening to just get you you confident at like a couple of the at one of those those areas and 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 take it from there I think I've definitely built what I do is all around being a seamstress I think just put that at the center of what you do and and build from there start with the craft and take it on on that journey I think another thing that I'm a really big fan of as well is a speculative letter so if there's someone you really want to work with even if it feels slightly unachievable and they might not be hiring, there might be nothing on their website, just send them a concise, professional CV and a really small portfolio of work, just a couple of images, doesn't have to be a lot, and reach out to them. And they might not be advertising for the role, but they might want the that, per, that junior position might come up and you'll be the first that they'll think of. So mm -hmm. I get now quite a lot of speculative letters from students wanting to intern. And I love, I would not really put the word out there that I was looking because mm -hmm. I would always prioritise working with someone who's kind of s s like seeked to work with me mm -hmm. above just, you know, an, an application. Right, right. It means so much to a business when someone has 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 identified that they really love what you're doing so mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of the speculative letter and actually I did that with some that works really well with stylists 
so for yeah. your seamstress who are in like the big cities where lots of you know stylists are if you're wanting to go into the the tv and film and celebrity work write to those stylists and just see if they need a seamstress and and just put your name forward mm -hmm. just like another job application like you won't know until you just like apply or get your name out there and probably like the more that you're applying and then you can refine the letters and like it just starts mm. with the first one you know, and like, even I remember like back when I was kind of doing like podcast research before I started this and how many times the, the common advice column would say like, put out your first episodes and don't think about it. Cause they're not going to be good. You know what I mean? So like your first 10 episodes are going to be like, mm, you're not going to be in a flow. And even now I feel like I'm still learning, but it's like, you just have to kind of put out the first application or like make the first contact and each one is going to get better and cleaner. And you're going to feel more confident each time, but it's kind of, it, it does kind of go back to the basics of like, just do the thing. <laughs> Definitely. Start just doing do it. The thing. Yeah. <laughs> like give it a go. And like, yeah. what's the worst that could happen? Probably they, someone might not reply or like mm -hmm. your, like, yeah, your, your reel or your podcast or whatever might not get loads of listens, but it will build and it will grow. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so, and you, I definitely, I definitely think you become better and better at it. Oh, totally. Yeah. And if nothing else, like your confidence changes. So you just don't feel like, oh, I'm putting this out into the ether. And like, I hope somebody watches. It's like, okay, you just feel a little better the more you just do the things. So definitely that's a good, good first step. Just take the yeah. first step. That's a good first piece of advice. I mean, <laughs> definitely. I think take the first step. I think and it can be really hard doing all the things as well. Mm -hmm. So like when you're doing the creative sewing and the work yourself and then you're having to promote yourself and you're having to find the next job so I think also just it doesn't happen overnight don't put it didn't happen for me overnight it was a you know a 10-year slow burn mm -hmm. and there was definitely seasons where I was working like all the time and seasons where I I wasn't doing so much so it's fine to to go through that and yeah. and kind of give yourself a break yeah but it's not going to be like if it doesn't happen you know in in a month that's absolutely fine yeah yeah but something that I feel very I guess the word would be like hopeful for with our industry is that we're we're very needed we're very necessary mm-hmm like weddings aren't going anywhere mm -hmm. people love once people have a taste of having their clothes fitted as well they love having their clothes looking really good on their body type mm -hmm. so I'm really I feel like we're entering a really good era of where people are buying better they they want to buy investment pieces that want them to fit really beautifully so it's never really been better potentially to be a seamstress yeah I agree yeah, yeah. we've mm -hmm. got the best job yeah <laughs> <laughs> I agree I agree and it's like and just even seeing like how we're being taken a little more seriously in the wedding industry as a whole like there's just that recognition and it's not that we need the recognition but the recognition leads to just a greater understanding of what we do and mm. the value increase. You know what I'm saying? I think for a long time, it's just kind of been this like, oh yeah, you, but you buy the dress and then there's like somebody who sews in the basement and works in your dress. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But it's like, yeah. okay, now like, you know, and part of that is a generational thing. Like the new generation of seamstresses, I think are, are maybe a little bit louder with like, okay, this is what we do. And this is what you can expect. This is what you can expect to pay. Like it's a little more informative and setting brides up to enjoy the process because they know what to expect. Like we talked about before expectations, right? So yeah. um, I love that. Just leaving on a hopeful note, like this is a great time, whether you are in the middle of your seamstress career and you're like, oh, I'm feeling kind of tired. Okay. Let's, we can drop a few things. We can refine mm -hmm. our practices. You can really focus on just only what you enjoy. And then if you are just hopping on the seamstress train recently, like this is a great time to get involved. So where do you see Grace Lane in like five years? Like what's left oh. to do? 
<laughs> I feel like there's so much left to do. I <laughs> feel like I, so I'm definitely someone, and this is probably like the business people out there are going to be like, no, <laughs> I, don't think too, I don't think too far ahead. Mm-hmm. I'd never have a really long term like plan or strategy. I think I think around a year ahead. And I yeah, I really don't know. I really don't know what okay, let's give it okay, let's let's break it down a little bit easier. Where would you yeah. be like where do you want to be December of this year? End of the year. So end of the year, I'm looking at growing my team. So mm, okay. it's still it's me with freelancers and like assistants or interns when it's busy, mm-hmm. which is the kind of summer months, and then in the quieter right. months it's just me. And I have my first. I'm taking on my first assistant, like part time, but for like long term. In she starts next week. And so that's a really going to be really exciting for me. I I already feel like the amount that like I just do on my own, like having someone else to like do the the kind of the assisting roles is going to really open up like a lot of time for me. And I'm really looking yeah. forward to to working with with the assistant as well, and and having you know someone else to bounce ideas off and yeah, giving yeah. someone the opportunity as well who she's just graduated. So maybe I'd be looking at potentially like growing the team and and getting a couple of people in. I think that would yeah. be really exciting for me. And yeah, I've always been slightly nervous of getting bigger because it is such a responsibility to mm-hmm. have someone, you know, under your wing and working for you. Yeah. And, you know, obviously touching on we didn't haven't really touched on the pandemic years it's probably been so done now Mm -hmm. we've talked about it so much (laughs) but those years stayed with everyone I think and made Mm -hmm. me quite cautious in business oh so and I was really grateful that I didn't have a you know a team who would who were relying on me during those up and down stressful Mm -hmm. years of the pandemic but I finally feel like maybe things have reached a point where you know the work's coming in I'm it's pretty consistent I feel excited about maybe growing that side of things Mm -hmm. and yeah maybe doing more vintage reworking and taking that further yeah yeah if that's what's lighting you up now it's like that's very exciting to think about I was going to ask you a question do you have in your area are there lots of people interested in the vintage reworking side of things like is that popular your way? I don't know if I'd say it's popular I think there's a misunderstanding of what it takes to do that so like I've had even just recently I've had a few inquiries and then when I give the quote of like the time and then the financial investment it's like oh mm. well, this is my budget and it's like okay well we can't do that on your budget you know what I mean so I think there's some interest but not at least in my specific area. I'm not in Seattle. I wonder, I think Seattle and Portland are kind of my two big cities on either side. I think especially Mm -hmm. in Portland, there's a bigger market for that, but it's becoming more of an appreciated trend, but I wouldn't necessarily call it popular yet. That's really interesting. And can you Mm -hmm. pick up, can you buy like nice vintage in your way or is it hard Um, to find the pieces? I think it's hard to find well kept pieces you know what I'm mm. and oftentimes the inquiries are from women who have the dresses in their families already and so they want to mm. do something with the, the dress that they already have but yeah I don't think it's it's not necessarily uncommon but it's certainly not like popular you mm. know and, that's and, really interesting mm-hmm. and I think I'm seeing more of like oh I have my grandmother's dress I don't really want to wear it but I want to use elements of her dress in and we put it into a veil or into a garter or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So there's mm-hmm. and what's weird too is because of like the newer generations of brides, like they have to, in order for them to bring in like a, a true vintage dress, they're going back multiple generations when they're bringing mm. in their, their dress. It's like from the eighties, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the 70s. It's not like 
vintage th that I would think of vintage. Like I had a, a bride recently, she brought on her grandmother's dress and I was like, Ooh, I was so excited. And it was from JC Penny, which is like this department store, you know, like and it was super wow. cheesy. And I'm like, Oh yeah. my gosh, here I was thinking I was going to have this like really cool. And I'm like, like picking it up. Like, what is this? <laughs> kind of had to like make some adjustments that was a couple of years was it just last year or a couple of years ago and so it just you know like that's I think there's just some education maybe that has to take place like what is true vintage and here's what you can expect to invest in you know vintage redesign and here's where to find the vintage dresses if you want to shop around for them so yeah yeah that's a really good point so I think vintage is becoming also over here harder and harder to get really really good pieces mm -hmm. they they are around but you know again they're very expensive if you get a really beautiful piece a very old piece yeah so there is it's not necessarily scalable like right, you have to, right. would do it quite cleverly like mm -hmm. you have to really i that's why i would always i think need other avenues it couldn't necessarily be a sole thing because mm -hmm. it's not like a very sort of replicatable thing. It's so unique right. every single time. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Grace. This was like very fun. And it was so fun to talk about the things that we both have going on. And up yeah. in the world. That was really fun. <laughs> it was so, so fun to speak to you. And yeah, and we have to get you like just a little more plugged in over here. I know there's a time difference, but you know, we can still work around that. So definitely yeah. yes, yes, and, yes. and then where do our listeners find you so you i share both accounts on grace lane london is my bridal account and grace lane studio is my film and tv and celebrity seamstress account okay both are very fun to look through so listeners you're encouraged to go take a peek and <sighs> i'm excited for your next now i like i'm excited to look at your next project too like okay what is she going to post next so thank you so much for just sharing your insights and your ideas and encouraging listeners that we're in it for the long haul and we don't know what's going to come our way like five ten years down the road so just keep trucking along oh you're so welcome and thank you so much for having me Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and share this podcast with a friend. And if you're feeling really generous, leave a review. Thanks, everyone.